5. <clears throat> That's great news. She must obey this. It's not something that, that she realized this is true. She probably ran back to tell them. When she got there, as we saw, they didn't want to believe her in Mark 16. Now, that's interesting to me. There, it's always interesting to me how the disciples responded. Because here is what they should have known, but they were rejecting. This is a remarkable event. Think about it. They had followed the Lord Jesus those three years. They saw Him arrested. They saw His su sufferings, His death, and that, that he, they were under that persecution. And He was, in their mind, I guess, wiped out, caught up in it, and wiped out. So in, they believed He was gone. And uh, they were convinced of that. This is one of the uh, uh, convincing proofs that Jesus was really alive. The fact that the disciples did not believe it. Because if you were writing the book yourself, you wouldn't put that in there. Their unbelief. If we were writing a book about and wanted to convince others, we wouldn't want to put in, in it all of the unbelief of people. Of those that are supposed to be the closest. Peter was there. John was there. James was there. These, these guys were there. We've already been through the story of Peter's denial. We've already talked about Judas' betrayal. Why in the world would we have all of this in the story if one convinced the whole world of the living Christ and the reality of the truthfulness of the Christianity? You see what I'm saying? So it, it, is, uh, it adds to the authenticity of the book and the story. When we see this, he's living. She must obey. Tell them. Because they must hear the good news. I'm returning to my Father. I'm returning to my Father. Now, Jesus had said in John 17, in that great prayer, when we went through that chapter together, he talked about the glory that He had with His Father before the world began. And that was His condition. The, the glory and the presence of the Father before the world began. When we pass through the story of the transfiguration, Peter, James, and John are there. Jesus goes up on the mountain and He's transfigured before them whiter and bright, bright, white, shining, glistening like nothing that had ever been seen before. And there is Elijah and Moses there. So like a preview of the second coming and the glory of Jesus there in front of the disciples. A preview of it. Now he's saying, I'm going there. I'm returning. In the Gospel, we saw God so loved the world He gave His only Son. He sent His Son into the world. He sent His Son into the world from the glories of heaven. No one has ever come so far. Not even the angels because they didn't come from the same material. If that could be possibly said that way. They didn't because they're, He's the Son of God. They're just spirits. Ministering spirit. He's the Son of God. And He's going to return. He says, I'll go to my Father. What is witnessing anyway? When we think about our, ourselves and telling others and talking about the Gospel and the we read the story in the Bible and how the Gospel was spread through that first century and uh, first hundred years uh, of the that century, and then if we think about throughout Christian, what is witnessing anyway? Go and tell them I'm alive. When we put it down to that, there's a story. He's alive. He's not dead, still on a cross or a crucifix. He's living. And we know in the message He's coming again. Witnessing is basically sharing the news that we have a living Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 18. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I 
have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. You think a new life, you know, those demons were cast out of her. That was that relieved her physically and spiritually. But what about this confession? I have seen the Lord. Wow, so powerful. I witness uh, to the resurrected Christ. Our faith in the resurrected Christ is based on eyewitness accounts to the living Lord. Those who actually saw Him. They had been with Him before. They walked with Him through His sufferings. And they witnessed Him after His resurrection. I is an eyewitness account. I'm wondering, what can you say? Can you say, I know God. Not I know about God, but can you say, I know God? Can you say, I know Jesus is my personal Savior? She could say, I have seen the Lord. But what can we say? Can we say, I know He is the Lord? Can we say, I know He's living? Can we say, I know my sins are forgiven? Can you say, I know Jesus is coming again? You see, she could say, I have seen the Lord. She's passed, she did her job. She passed the message on. I've seen the Lord. But now what can we say? Have seen. There's a certainty in that. She says, I have seen the Lord. You know, back to Saul of Tarsus, he, uh, he repeated his testimony often uh, basically because that's all he had. And uh, on the road to Damascus, his life was totally transformed. And uh, he was brought before governors, kings, and he shared basically the same thing. I was traveling there. There was a bright light that shone. I was, you know, I could hear. The others couldn't hear, you know, the voice. Um, I was blinded. He told this part of the story in his uh, encounter with Jesus Christ that he actually saw the Lord. That's why he's qualified to be an apostle. And we should pay close attention to what the Apostle Paul taught in the New Testament. And he had the testimony. Jesus spoke to him. Now, sitting in front of me, not Mary Magdalene. She's not here this morning. Saul of Tarsus is not here today, right? Neither the host of apostles and disciples that we read about in the Bible. But we each one have a testimony. What is it you can say? Can you say, I know that He is my Savior. That He is living. She had a testimony to say. That was her testimony. We stand on her shoulders in a sense. But what about you? Who's standing on your shoulders? She said, I've seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. It's not a ghost that she saw. Not a dream or a nightmare or a vision like so many have, you know. But the Lord this was a bodily, physical resurrection. It's a very important point in the Gospel. Because we must believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. It's not allegory. It's the truth. They thought he was a ghost, and we'll we'll look at those appearances too. And, um, I'm sure they were shocked by that. And um, when Jesus came walking on the water out in the sea, rough seas, you know, they thought it was a ghost too. But he was actually walking on the water by the miracle power of God. Okay. And when he appears to the disciples through the wall, the doors being locked. Because they're afraid of the Jews. He appears through the wall. I'm sure they're thinking. Maybe this is 
a ghost. When Peter shows up, if you remember in the book of Acts, from prison and he's knocking on the door and the servant girl goes to the door and she's so, uh, she's so shocked by the situation, she doesn't even open the door. She goes back and tells him and they're thinking, the disciples are thinking, it's a ghost. So they had those beliefs at that time. But not Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene says, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. It's not a ghost. It's not a dream or a vision or a nightmare. Or some spirit floating around, disembodied. It's the Lord. He's there. She saw Him. We must believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead. Mary did not recognize Jesus at first. We read that. Her grief blinded her. She could not see Him because she didn't expect to see Him. Is there anything blinding you from believing and trusting in the resurrected and living Lord Jesus Christ? At first she didn't. She thought it was a garden. What else could she believe? This is a tremendous event that's taking place. But you know, even today, people are blinded. What is blinding you from believing and trusting in the resurrected and living Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe you've embraced Him. You know He's alive. You know, but you know that He's coming again too. Maybe you do. That's great comfort. This certainty of the resurrection. <coughs> Secondly, when Jesus spoke her name, she immediately recognized Him. Can you imagine how she must have felt when she heard Him speak her name? Listen, friends. Jesus is near you. He is calling your name. Can you, like Mary, regard Him as your Lord? He knows your name. When Mary realized that Jesus was alive, she received His command to go and tell the disciples. She was filled with joy and she hurried to tell the disciples. What's your response to Jesus' command to go and tell others? This, this morning, I was thinking about this um, because Jesus said, go tell my brothers. Now Jesus is calling His disciples brothers. Do you know there's a new relationship possible now? Something not possible without Jesus Christ. Without His sacrifice, His death, and His resurrection, there's a new relationship possible for you to be a son or daughter of the Lord Jesus. To be brought into His family. He's not ashamed. And I was looking in Hebrews 2. I'm going to close with this. Hebrews chapter 2. It's verse 17. Jesus had told Mary, I'm going to my God and to your God. My Father and to your Father. She is brought into that family. When the disciples were looking for Jesus, when He was teaching one time, he was told, kind of interrupted, and said, your disciples are out here. Or your mother and your brothers are looking for you. And Jesus said, my mother and my brothers are those, you know, that hear the Word of God and to obey. A family. There's a new relationship. It's like a new paradigm that's set up through the grace and power of Jesus. A new family. Hebrews 2. Ten. Two ten. 
It says, In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. <coughs> Verse 11. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here, I, here am I and the children God has given me. Such a powerful passage. He's not ashamed to call them brothers. My friend, if your faith is in Jesus Christ today, I can assure you of one thing. He is not ashamed of you. He's not. His blood covers not some of your sins. His blood covers all of your sins. He takes away that shame. He removes that guilt. He takes away the condemnation of it. Without Him, we're lost. We're rejected. Without Him, we're covered in sin and condemnation and guilt. And we go to judgment with no hope. But with Him, He says, I'm not ashamed to call you brother or sister. Let's pray together. Okay.